about to hear a revolution in talk radio, Liberty Talk Radio, where the critical thinking will defrag your mind of propaganda-ridden viruses induced by mass media news programming. No BS here, just the facts. And now we present to you America's quintessential iconoclastic anomaly. Wow. In talk radio, your host, Joe Cristiano. Welcome, everyone, to Liberty Talk Radio. I'm your host, Joe Cristiano. Our guest today is Jacob Hornberger, founder and president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, an educational foundation that advances the libertarian philosophy and, quite frankly, in the interest of uh, of uh, self self exposure. I guess. Ex- 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 um, not exposure. What word I'm looking for? <laughs> um, anyway, I I am uh, uh, proudly support. Uh, I have supported financially that that organization for many years. Not totally, just just giving them a support, some financial support. Jacob was formerly a program director at the Foundation of Economic Education, and prior prior to that, he was an attorney for 12 years. We will not hold that against him, at least not today. <laughs> Today's segment is entitled "Opening Minds on Open Borders," probably the most misunderstood concept, which is necessary for the preservation of our freedom, as well as the goodwill among all men and women. Welcome, Jacob, to our show. Thank you, Joe. Great to be here. <laughs> Say, oh, nice to see you. And by the way, I was going to mention this in our pre-show, which we didn't have, unfortunately, but I could not find you in Austin a couple of months ago in April during the Young Americans for Liberty uh, War on Terror and War on Drugs conference with uh, Ron Paul, Greenwall, and Balco. And of course, you, you did a great job of... Uh, of uh, moderating, yet uh, afterwards we went to speak with uh, Ron Paul and, and the rest of the group, and we couldn't find you. Did you did you escape after that or what? No, I hung out for a while, but uh, but then I took off. In fact, I went back to the hotel with Greenwald, so oh, I was geez. there for a while. I was so yeah, disappointed. Sorry I missed you. Well, I it, it was probably our fault. What I should have done is given you a call in advance and say I was going to be there. Don't go away. But by the time we got on the line, because we did buy the books and we had them sign and we talked for a minute, you know, <clears throat> I f- f- in my own demented mind, I thought you would be roaming around you know, aimlessly and I would find you somehow, <laughs> but I didn't. But anyway, uh-huh. we, we did, my wife and I did drive down. It was a great conference. I think for the four hours that the conference lasted, whatever it was, was the most, um, well, I think, uh, gratifying four, four hours that I have experienced in a long time. You did a fabulous job. Well, thank you. It's fantastic that you were there. Yeah, I sure miss uh, meeting you that we just had an awesome time. We had more than 700 people attend. Right. We had Glenn Greenwald, Radley Balco, Ron Paul. Ron gave the best talk I've ever seen him give. Right. I mean, he was, people were applauding about every 15 seconds. Right. And all the videos are on our website at FFF.org. It was just a fun event. It was intellectual. It was important. And um, fortunately, we, we have all the videos online for people to see. The, the panel, I thought, was really the Really, the oh, highlight. That, that was the great. highlight. Yeah, it yeah. was fantastic. I, I was the guy that asked a question uh, when the um, um, coordinator for the Young Americans for Liberty uh, asked for questions. I said, "What is the resp- What response do you get from your professors?" You know. Uh, I was the one that asked that question, and he laughed, and he said, good question. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently he doesn't receive a very warm welcome, nor which, which really disturbed me because I've, I've spoken with groups from, the, um, uh, from other student organizations, and they all seem to have the, the same response when I asked them about what type of dialogue do they have with the faculty? And it seems that although we're in a uh, in an environment of higher learning, critical thinking goes out the window, and you do what you're told. It's it's almost like a a quasi Gestapo type learning session, and you would think that they would be encouraging alternate ways of thinking, regardless of what bent you're in. At least have that discussion because that's what colleges are supposed to be about. And it seems that we have seemed to have lost some of that. Well, yeah, I think part of the problem is that most of these school teachers are products of the public school system, right. which it which grinds all that out. I mean, the last thing they're going to teach in public schooling is an independent, nonconformist mindset. As soon as somebody starts reflecting that, they put him on Ritalin or Adderall or some other drug. They think something's wrong with him. <laughs> right. So you have this system that I call it army light that grinds its way through. And so you end up producing a group of people in, in different professions, the law professions the same way, 
that end up being the conformists, the people that, that believe in group think, that you have to think the right way, the government approved way. And any any sign of deviance from that is is considered dangerous and needs to be stamped out. Yeah, you know, I've I've totally changed my approach when I speak with people, and they ask me, oh, oh are you a conservative? Because they assume I'm a conservative. I say, oh no, I'm a liberal. They go, well, but you believe in Obamacare? I said, no, I'm a liberal, not a socialist. You know, but I don't say <laughs> classical liberal because that throws them off even more so. So I, I I've changed my tactics, and it really makes them think a little bit more. They say, well. What do you mean socialist? I say, well, if you're, you know, if you're a, a typical liberal, you know, if you're a progressive, basically, which is what the liberals are today, uh, then you're a socialist. I'm not a socialist. And then they can't argue with you. And they don't say, well, you know, well, the conservatives, you, you get out of that paradigm and it leads to a much more interesting discussion because then they start asking questions because they don't understand what you're saying. And, and I'm going to use that as a segue to our conversation today because open borders has got to be the most misunderstood concept of all the issues that are on the table today. Uh, most are misunderstood. This, this by far knocks them all out of the ballpark. Uh, people do not understand, and please correct me, you're the expert, I'm, I'm just a dumb talk show host, you just correct me wh wh where I go astray. But our forefathers talked about all men being created equal. And what is it about all men, and of course they meant men and women, are created equal, don't you understand? If everyone is created equal, why is someone south of the border or north of the border less equal than us? Please help me with that. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, and, and it, it's really a fascinating mindset. I mean, obviously there was a big exception to, to, to what they believed, and that was slavery. Right. Uh, but but for that, that exception, that was the mindset, that all men and women are created equal. So that's why when you look at, for example, the, the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, it doesn't just protect American citizens. You look at the Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, Sixth Amendment, Eighth Amendment. These amendments protect people, all people, regardless of citizenship, from the federal government. And that's, again, pursuant to this idea that everybody's created equal. Everyone's got the right to pursue happiness. And that includes Guatemalan citizens, Mexican citizens, French citizens, American citizens. You have a right, a fundamental God-given right. It doesn't come from the government. It right. pre-exists government, and government, therefore, cannot infringe or interfere with fundamental God-given rights. Yeah, and, and there's this, this uh, 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 the perception that if people who want to work toil, basically, I, I, work is not the right word, it's more the toil, you know, than anything else, that come from, especially from the Central American uh, countries and Mexico, and come into the United States to work, they are taking work away from Americans. Well, if that was the case, why don't why don't all the unemployed youths in Detroit move to Southern California or Texas or you know the southern states where farm hands are needed and take those jobs? Why are they staying in Detroit when the work is down south? They're not moving, but yet people from Detroit don't go to uh, Southern California or to Texas. But you have people from Guatemala coming up from Guatemala to Texas. What does that tell you? Well, it, it tells you that there's people that, that love to work hard and do jobs that Americans find very distasteful. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I mean, I, I grew up on the Texas-Mexican border, right? They're on the border in Laredo, Texas. And so I grew up around illegal aliens. I grew up on a farm. We hired them on our farm. You will never find harder working people than immigrants, people that are willing to come over here, leave family and friends and custom and culture and language. And so there's a reason that American employers love to hire these people. They love to hire them because they're the hardest working people you'd ever find. And they actually produce jobs. That's, that's what a lot of Americans don't realize, is that the economic vitality that immigrants bring into a society creates jobs. I mean, immigrants need uh, to go out and buy a used car, say, for to get transportation from home to, to work. They need clothes for their family. They need to buy groceries. This then produces 
jobs in the sectors where that new consumer demand is taking place. Correct. And those are the sectors that hire the Americans that are, might say, better educated, better able to deal with people at a service uh, business level. And so history has shown that eco- free, free immigration is a tremendous boon to a society. It's not a burden. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm repeating myself probably for the 19th time, and I, I have to apologize to everyone who listens to this program because they've heard the story a dozen times. I, I was in Europe once, and I was on a street corner, and there was a concrete uh, pillar. And on one side of the pillar, there was an S, you know, in, in, uh, engraved, and on the other side, there was an F. And I'm standing there, and I'm looking at it, and I asked someone, what is that? They said, well, on that side is Switzerland, and that side's France. I apologize and, and to everyone who listens to this program because they've heard the story what, what happened, a dozen times. Was, oh, hold on a second. We just, we, just, we just lost something. We need to fire our yeah. board operator here. There we go. Did we lose okay. anyone? No, no. We Jacob, are you still there? Yeah, he's still there. I'm there. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. And it, it, it shocked the heck out of me because here I am. I'm on the street corner. Very few people around. Very, it was very little traffic. And you look one way, it's, if, if, you, if I went two steps this way, I was in France. I went step, two steps this way, I was in Switzerland. No border guard. There was nothing other than this little concrete uh, pillar, if you will. It was about four feet high. And, and that was it. That's the only thing that indicated that you, which country you were in. And I said, well, why does it make any difference? What difference? Why do we have to have, why do we even have to have immigration if people come here they come here if they, um, um, uh, if they live here. They live according to the rules and regulations of that country. If they uh, uh, comply with the rules and regulations of that country, they pay the taxes or they work or they do everything honestly and whatever. What difference does it make if they have a piece of paper saying that I have a green card or red card or whatever the case may be? What difference does it make? They don't want to live here. Uh, and if they want to live here, let them live here. So what? What I, I don't understand the distinction when we say we need to have people licensed and, and approved and whatever, uh, because every time you prevent people from coming in, the people who do come in are those people that you don't want, and those are the ones that cause the problem. It is, 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 am I just getting too old that I just can't see something that's maybe <laughs> very obvious or what? Uh, it sounds to me like you're seeing things very clearly. I mean, you know, when you deal with people on a daily basis, you don't know who's a citizen who and who isn't. And I've never seen anyone go up to somebody and say, are you a citizen? I'm not sure I can do business with you if you're not. I mean, nobody asks those questions. Right. When you go into McDonald's, you may see some people speaking Spanish in the back there. You don't go and say, I need to know whether you're a citizen or not. I mean, yeah. The only people that care whether you have official papers as a citizen is the immigration service. And there's this, there's this bromide that, that, oh, well, if you open the borders, the borders disappear. It's ridiculous. Just because people are free to cross borders doesn't mean the border disappears. As you say, when you cross a border, whether it's into Switzerland or, or from just a state, from one state to another, when you cross from Maryland into Virginia, the, the border stays there. And you're now subject to the laws of Virginia. Right. And uh, that's the way it would be with open open borders, that people cross the border, they do business or whatever, and they're free to go back home. They don't have to become an American citizen. You can retain your citizenship. I mean, this is the principle on which America was founded. A lot of Americans don't realize that uh, that we had open borders throughout the 19th century. Right, the, that's correct. The, on Ellis Island, it was a superficial type of uh, inspection for tuberculosis but for that you know you were free to come in no questions asked in the southwest totally open borders not even a tb inspection um, it's a remarkable way of life that our founding fathers established here yeah. you know my, my father's an excellent example of that he came here with not a penny uh he uh, left war-torn europe uh or Europe that was at, on the verge of war, and he, he saw that coming, and he left. Um, his um, his father had committed suicide because um, Mussolini had um, uh, taken over his comp- country, a uh, company, and destroyed him. Um, and he came over here so he can help support his family. And he came here with not a penny. 
um, he went into business for himself, and he has a long story. He, sh- he should have written a book when he was alive, but he goes, he, it was so fascinating, the things that he did in order to make a living. But he eventually, after about 20 years, o- opened a factory where they sewed ladies' gloves when ladies, women used to wear gloves, you know, white gloves when they went out. That was a fashionable thing to do. And he actually um, hired at one time, had 200 women on his payroll sewing gloves. Wow. In, in wow. a factory. I mean, and, and one something, what was amazing is they, they got paid very, very well. They were on piecework, and boy, did they belch those gloves out. And uh, he did contract work for Kaiser Roth. That work, which needed to be done immediately, and they couldn't have done overseas because it would take six months to get here, and the fashion by that time would be over. So he was the uh, fill-in person. And he did very, very well. Here's a man with nothing. He borrowed $14 from his mother-in-law that he always regretted. <laughs> she reminded him every minute. But here's a, here's a case of someone. And, and when, by the way, when he passed away, you still couldn't understand him. <laughs> he still had this <laughs> accent that you couldn't understand him. I got around, sort of understood him a little bit, but he had a very thick accent. So here's a guy who could hardly read and write. I mean, he can read and write, but uh, not very well. Could hardly understand. And he... And he uh, developed a company that employed 200 people. How did that hurt our economy? And and he came in and just signed the paper and walked in, basically, just like through Ellis Island. Yeah, I mean, th- this the, you're, they're just fascinating stories like that. I mean, I love that that inscription on the Statue of Liberty that says, you know, to Europe, keep your pompous people, your 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 royalty, and all that. Send us the wretched refuse of your right. teeming shores, the people at the bottom, because they're the ones that really want to work hard. They want to establish businesses and they want to care for their family. And so they're willing to give up everything. And your 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 grandfather or your father is a perfect example of this, that nobody forces him to learn English. Uh, nobody forces him to start a business. There's no welfare for him. He comes over here and with no money at all effectively starts a business that ends up hiring all these people like i said earlier it's a tremendous boon i mean a society should be relishing open borders because you're going to be attracting the kind of people that bring a vitality to a society and economic dynamism yeah and And, uh, yeah and and not that my father was was wealthy uh when he passed away he passed away he was broke it dead broke. I mean, the only thing he had was a small Social Security check at the time, and that was it. He died, a, um, unfortunately, a horrible death, but, you know, through cancer and, and other things, and it was it was horrible. He suffered for years. And um, so all that work, and he suffered the, the last few years of his life, and he was, he was dead broke. I mean, we just had to support him and, and, and keep him going. Uh, but that was what was family was for. It, it seemed that none of this exists anymore. We, um, uh, you, know, you know, give us your tired, your poor, your, your uh, huddled masses yearning to be free. I mean, don't we read that? Your huddled masses yearning to be free. People from Central America and, and Mexico and South America are coming here yearning to be free. And then we, we, they come here and we enslave them. What happened to this country? I, I just go nuts when I think about it. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing thing that we treat people so brutally. We, we, we raid their homes. We, we stop them on the highways. We incarcerate them. I mean, this, this was one of my first time. I grew up a liberal, a, a progressive, and uh, I believe that government should be taking care of the poor. I, I believed in, in that vision. And, you know, Joe, the thing that caused me to start wondering whether this was the right way was I, I when I was in Laredo, I was practicing law, and I walked into a detention center, and it was filled with illegal aliens. It was like a concentration camp, and as I looked around, I looked at all these guys. It just hit me. I said, "How can these people, liberals, progressives, who claim to help the poor, love the poor with their welfare state, do this to these people? Right. I mean, all they want to do is work, That's and they're right. in jail." Yeah. And that's when it hit me. Uh Uh-uh. There's something wrong with this picture. Yeah. And that's when I started going and discovering libertarianism. Yeah. Yeah, we all have these aha moments. And when you think about it, those people who take advantage of of the system and are on welfare, not working, maybe even causing trouble... Uh, we uh, uh, place them in, in, in a higher position than those people who can't come here, don't have any papers, come here, work 12 hours a day, you know, to, to help 
up to help us produce the food that we eat, and yet we incarcerate them and we feel justified. And none of this makes any sense. Um, quite frankly, I think I'm losing my mind because it doesn't seem like anything we do ever makes sense again uh, any longer. And I, 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 whenever you approach these subjects, I, and from people who were born here, people who have been in the Army and the Navy and the, and you speak to them about it and they go, they think you're nuts, you're a radical, you can't do that because if we open borders, you know, all of these uh, terrorists are going to be coming in and flooding in and, and destroy the United States. Well, I, I, my response to them is that if you look at the coastline of the United States, Canada, the East Coast, West Coast, the Gulf Coast and whatever, and through Mexico and, and Southern California, um, what, what do we have, some 12 to 15,000 miles of coastline? Um, <laughs> question. Um, you think that that if you were a professional terrorist, you couldn't find the fifteen thousand miles to get here without being noticed? Well, not only that, but there's an estimated ten or twelve million illegal aliens in the country. If if they can get in, I would assume that some terrorists can get in too. Right. Uh, I mean, it's ridiculous. And really, the terrorism problem is 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 oriented or rooted in what the U.S. national security state is doing overseas. If, if they stop bombing people and killing people and assassinating people, you wouldn't have an anti-American terrorist problem. Uh, so what they do is they create the problem, and then they say, now we have to take away your freedom. And make no mistake about it, Joe, when they put immigration controls on, it's not just a control on the immigrant. It's a control on you and me. It's saying if you hire these people, we will put you in jail, and they do. They right. put Americans into jail for doing what I want with my own money, and I want to associate with a certain group of people. They put me in jail, and, and it's all because of their status vision of, oh, well, we need to control you to keep you safe from the enemies that we ourselves are producing. I mean, there's something yeah. wrong with that dictatorship done the same thing uh you know to protect the fatherland to protect the country to protect the citizens we need to initiate these strict controls for your own protection this is nothing new this has been going on for thousands of years and yet we 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 study this in history we know the end result is we are repeating what has been done thousands of times same results and yet you know, I guess we're lunatics because we expect a totally different result this time because we are exceptionally different. Oh, it, you're absolutely right that you, you, as soon as a crisis hits, that's when people are most afraid and that's when government pounces and gets people to, to surrender their liberty for the aura, the pretense that we're going to keep you safe. And it's always just temporary. Oh, the, the, as soon as the crisis is over, we'll give you back your freedom. Well, it's like, you know, the fox putting all the chickens into the chicken coop and saying, don't worry, as soon as the crisis is over, I'm going to let you all out of this chicken coop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that ain't going to happen. That's uh, right. Yeah. And, and, you know, the other fascinating part of this, Joe, is that you have this constant crisis. I mean, the immigration crisis has been here since I was a kid. And why is that? Well, because this is a socialist system. You've got a central planning system where the government's deciding who's going to come in, how many are going to come in, what quotas each country is going to have, tight controls. And so what does socialism always produce? What does central planning produce? Crises. In his head saying, why are we going to still have a crisis? We just had a reform. We just built a Berlin-type fence on the border. What's going on? Well, the reason is whenever you have this kind of status, centrally planned system, you're going to have a crisis. There is only one solution to this. There is no other, and that's open borders. Mm -hmm. Until people come to that realization, we're going to still have these paroxysms of, oh, my gosh, the illegal aliens are coming to get us. Yeah. Well, uh, Jacob, if you, if you could hold on just for about a minute, we have to br break for station identification. We shall be right back, please. Thank you. Sure. You're listening to Liberty Talk Radio. Political talk derived from a historical perspective, not always palatable, but good food for thought. Pure libertarian talk with host Joe Cristiano. LibertyTalkRadio.com. 
Express Test is your go-to company for on-site occupational health testing services. That's right. We sit on-site. That means we will meet you at your facility for a free health and occupational safety consultation. Express Test specializes in hearing conservation, respiratory protection, and employee safety. We can help you establish viable programs tailored to your business and employee needs. For your free consultation, call 918-743-2929 or visit us at expresstest.com. That's 918-743-2929 or expresstest.com. Do you find yourself asking, what did you say? Aaron Cristiano of Ranch Acres Audiology has over 25 years of experience helping patients just like you. Hearing requires conservation. We need to be aware and we need to be responsible for our own hearing health. Understand more with a little help from Ranch Acres Audiology. Call 918-749-7711. That's 918-749-7711 to learn more. We'd like to thank attorney Constance Squires for her support of Liberty Talk Radio. If you want a comprehensive way to affordably avoid legal issues, call Constance Squires. For a free consultation, call 918-254-9283 or go online at isthywilldone.com. Steve Harden of the Harden Insurance Agency has over 30 years of experience designing family insurance protection, including retirement planning. Call 918-488-0024 or go to hardenagency.com and request a free in-depth estate and retirement evaluation. We look forward to earning your trust and helping you meet your life goals. This isn't your typical talk radio show. This is Liberty, Liberty Talk Radio. Welcome back, everyone. This is Joe Cristiano. You're listening to Liberty Talk Radio. And with us today, we have Jacob Hornberger, founder and president of the Future of Freedom Foundation. We're talking about opening minds on open borders. Uh, oh, by the way, I wanted to mention that we did have Dalton Lane on our program, the uh, chairman for the uh, uh, state chair for the uh, Young Americans for Liberty, you know, who sponsored that program in, 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 in Austin a couple of months ago. And he did an excellent job. Um, the one of the big objections to open borders is uh, the drug trade. Uh, we open the borders, and all these drugs will be coming in, and uh, you know we'll just become one big uh, you know drug nation, and uh, uh, the Mexican cartel will take over the entire United States, and we'll all be sitting there putting needles in our arms, and so we need to stop that. Does that make any sense to you? <laughs> Well, it does for you, Joe, because you look like the kind of person who's just waiting to get your injection of heroin. Oh, hurry up, hurry up. (laughs) (laughs) My wife says, I don't need anything. (laughs) I'm already there without the drugs. (laughs) I'm alive. Yeah, I mean, uh, in case nobody's, uh, somebody hasn't noticed, there are more than enough drugs coming into the United States. Whatever people want, people are getting. And so the idea that, they're, that they've got uh, these drug controls on the border stopping that from happening is ridiculous. Look, I mean, here's a classic example of two government interventions, and, and they really go side by side because they're both always producing a crisis, the, the war on immigrants and the war on drugs. Uh, there's, there's really only one solution to the drug war, and it's, well, it's the same solution to the immigration war, and that is just legalize it. That the prohibition never worked with alcohol. We all know that. We finally had to get rid of that. Prohibition hasn't worked on drugs either. It's a total fiasco. And you've got all the collateral damage, the the violence, the robberies, the muggings. There's one only one way to put drug cartels out of business. Legalize drugs. That way, all of a sudden, it's reputable businesses that are selling the drugs the same way they were throughout the 19th century, pharmacies, regular established businesses. Nobody's dying from corrupted drugs anymore because you've got high quality products being provided by pharmacies and drug companies. And then all of a sudden you get rid of all the violence associated with the drug war. No more cartels, no more gang wars, none of the the corruption, the asset forfeiture. So it's the same thing, Joe. I mean, the best thing we could ever do in this country right today is in the drug war and in the war on immigrants. Boom open up the borders and get rid of of the drug laws be you the know, greatest I, thing we could ever do in this country i i, I mentioned to uh apologists you know uh i said what what we need to understand is that 
the only reason why there is a drug cartel in Mexico is because we in the United States are financing it. So we are responsible for it. If, if I financed you to go into business to do some horrifically terrible thing to society, I would be responsible because I knowingly financed you to do that. Without me, you would be incapable of uh, perpetrating those illegal acts. And but that's exactly what we're doing. We cannot apply the same principles of the individual to the government. It's like, well, if we did it, it's wrong, but if the government does it, it's right. The, the, the same thing with every single, whether it be uh, uh, immigration, whether it be drugs, all you have to do is get the government involved, restrict it, and then you have total chaos. Now, we've done this thousands of times over and over again. We make mistakes every single time, and every program results the same way. We have terrorism. Well, we, we have to combat terrorism. Well, who are the terrorists? Well, uh, I have a very good friend of mine who's a real very con of the conservative persuasion. He says, "Well, anytime anybody will cut the head off, you know, one of our journalists or whatever, you know, will she go there and kill them, you know?" And uh, and I said, "Well, in, in a sense, you're right. I mean, you know, if someone just did that, then there should be a way of, you know, some sort of retribution. That person should be arrested or whatever." I said, "But maybe that person acted because." his son and daughter was killed in a cluster bomb via a drone. And I said, now, how do you respond to that? Well, they never have the answer. They don't realize we are creating terrorism. We create terrorism. We create drug laws, lords, and then we have to fight what we created, but no one wants to accept that. They just want to accept the end result, saying these people are bad, we need to fight, we need to spend more money doing it, and we're very ineffective doing it at the same time. When are we going to learn, Jacob? Well, that's, that's an excellent analysis. I mean, when, when you make something illegal, a peaceful activity like drug possession or drug usage or drug sales or crossing a border in search of work, you're inevitably going to get a black market. I mean, this this is this is the law of economics. There's supply and demand. Just because you make a peaceful activity illegal doesn't mean people are going to just stop doing it. That history has shown that people are going to continue trying to sustain their lives and improve their lives, or ingest harmful substances or mind-altering substances. So you get a black market. That's just a fact of life. And so you get drug lords and drug cartels or Al Capones. You get uh, I illegal alien transporters, they call them coyotes, you know, transporting people across the deserts. And then, then the whole focus becomes on the drug lords and the drug cartels and the coyotes and instead of getting to the root of the problem. Right. And your analogy with the drug, with the war on terrorism is exactly the same thing. They, they went into the Middle East after they lost their Cold War enemy, the Soviet Union, with the demise of the Cold War. They started provoking hornet's nests over there. They, they they invade Iraq. They have sanctions in Iraq that are killing multitudes of Iraqi children. The anger is developing. It's fomenting. We were writing articles before 9-11 saying, stop the sanctions. Stop what you're doing. You're making people angry. And, of course, they didn't listen. And then they get the terrorist attacks. And 9-11 wasn't the first time. There was the 93 attack on the World Trade Center. And the terrorists were saying, this is the reason. That's Look right. Yeah, what they you're doing in the Middle East. <laughs> And yet, yeah, you're right. Then the focus becomes, oh, the terrorists, oh, the, the illegal alien transporters, oh, the drug cartels. Get to the root of the problem. Get rid of the apparatus that is sustaining these kind of things. And then all of a sudden, we restore a peaceful, harmonious, prosperous society, yeah. which is really what we all want, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, we live under a perpetual war, perpetual crisis environment. What kind of life is that? Hmm. You know, when, when, whenever my friends say that, I say, you have to understand that the government is really not financing all of these um the war on drugs and, and uh, the war on terrorism. We're not financing that. The government is not doing it. And they say, well, who is? I said, you are. I said, you are paying taxes to the government. The government is using it to collude with the military industrial complex to build more weapons of destruction to be used overseas. Then uh, when they become, of course, they become incredibly wealthy, they take a portion of that money, give it back to the 
politicians for their campaign. They say the right words to make you believe that they're on your side. And they, they, they repeat this cycle over and over again. And the person who is responsible for the war on terror, the war on drugs, and all of the killing is the citizen of the United States because we willingly give our money to the government to do exactly that. And boy, does that get them hot. Well, it, what's important to me, Joe, is is that we get people to start talking about the fact that this is a systemic problem. It's a problem right. with the system. It's not a matter of getting better people in public office. It's not a matter of getting the right person as president. That what happened is Americans, and this is where I place responsibility of the American people, they, they abandoned the founding governmental structure of this country in many ways. They, they put into existence a welfare state. Well, America wasn't founded on a welfare state. And they put into existence this national security apparatus after World War II, the CIA, the Pentagon, the huge standing military, the overseas military bases. And they imposed uh, drug laws, they imposed immigration controls. If you can get people to start thinking about the system and saying, look, all we have to do is get rid of these statist apparatuses, then all of a sudden they start seeing, hey, now I can see how we restore the, the, the way life is supposed to be in the United States. To me, it's not so much that people are paying their taxes because people are forced to pay taxes. It's what those taxes are going to. And I think right. that's what you're alluding to. Right, exactly, that yes. If you get rid of the, let's say, the national security apparatus, the, it's a Cold War dinosaur. It's causing nothing but problems for the United States. If you get rid of drug laws, if you get rid of immigration controls, now all of a sudden when you pay your taxes, and I'm certainly no supporter of taxes, but if you got to pay them, they might as well be doing where the government is doing the, what government should be doing, punishing murderers and rapists and thieves instead of all these engaging in peace, I mean, regulating peaceful activity and causing problem overseas for us. Yep. And what's interesting is when you listen to the Republican uh, candidates uh, for president, and of course this, this is just starting to heat up now, the, 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 the two uh, uh, issues that they all have in common is that we need to secure our borders and we need to fight against terrorism. And they, <laughs> they all repeat the same thing. And I will include Rand Paul in that, which really upsets me. I just read an article uh, in Re Reason Magazine. It was about six or seven or eight page article on Rand Paul. And they gave, you know, what his thinking was and whatever. And it, 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 it mystifies me how you can be the son of Ron Paul and take the position he's taken on those issues. Yeah, he's an interesting case, but uh, you, you reminded me of, of Ron Paul, the father, when he was in that first presidential debate. And um, he came out and said, the reason they came over here on 9-11 is because the U.S. government was over there killing people. And man, they all pounced on him. Rudy Giuliani pounced on him. Right. Because they all have this same mindset. Yeah. That, oh, uh, the, 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 the terrorists hate us for our freedom and values, and it has nothing to do with the fact that the government goes over there and bombs and sanctions and kills multitudes of innocent people. Uh, now, you're right. Iran's an interesting case because he clearly is different from the rest of them. I mean, he, in terms of his devotion to civil liberties and against the Patriot Act, I mean, he clearly has a different vision from them, but yet he's not consistent. He, he's not... He's not, he doesn't see the, the case for non-intervention totally. Right. So it's sort of an ad hoc thing. Hey, don't go here, but go there. And it's, it's a shame that he doesn't take that consistent approach that says this philosophy of foreign interventionism has been a disaster. Right. And I think that's the role that we have out here in the private sector is to keep working and talking to people and raising public awareness of the fact that there is an alternative to this way of life and that's a philosophy where government is limited to what it should be doing and it should not be doing what what it should not be doing is engaged in an empire and with foreign military bases foreign regime change operations foreign support of dictators assassinations and all the rest yeah and look what's happening now in uh, in, in Yemen you have the, the 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 richest country in the Middle East bombing the the life out of the the poorest country in the Middle East, you know, backed by the Americans uh, 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 and, and using American weapons. 
and being uh, supported and financially supported by the Americans, uh, that's got to foster so much hatred. Well, I, I get asked, they say, well, what would you do with Iran and their nuclear weapons? I said, I would sell them a nuclear reactor. And they go, well, why would you do that? I said, well, if it's our reactor and we have the parts for it, we can make money. Uh, if it breaks down, they have to come to us. <laughs> I mean, they're not going to use it against us. And why would they use uh, nuclear weapons against the United States? I mean, for, for what reason would they do that? Even if they did, by the time a, a rocket was shot into the air, of course, we, we have satellites all over the place, we would probably knock it out, and uh, it would take just three or four nuclear bombs from our thousands of our, of, of our arsenal of probably hundreds or maybe thousands of nuclear weapons and that would be one big hellhole within within 30 minutes well, which would be ridiculous because we'd, the radiation would kill everyone in the surrounding area the whole concept is 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 insanity and it doesn't make any sense no one's going to go to in, in uh, to war in a nuclear fashion in an area that is so congested and so small they talk about Israel, uh, um, you know, they have to protect themselves against Israel or Israel may, you know, attack uh, Iran or Iran is going to attack Israel. Well, they can't. I, uh, I don't think Israel is any bigger than Oklahoma City here in Oklahoma. And uh, if, if there was a nuclear attack on Oklahoma City, everyone in Tulsa would wind up dying from radiation. It's not going to happen. And they don't seem to have any logic other than black white good bad and of course we're always good and we're always the white guys well yeah and and you 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 have the historical fact that the u.s does engage in regime change operations but it won't do it against regimes that have nuclear weapons like north korea right. so and so look at the perverse incentives here you've got a government that engages in regime change operations what incentive does that have except for a target of a regime change operation to say well they don't attack countries that have a nuclear bomb so we better get a nuclear bomb and and of course there's no evidence that iran's doing that but let's not forget what the cia which is the u.s government did in 1953 in iran they went in there and they ousted in a secret coup the right. democratically elected prime minister of the country, a man named Mohammed Mossadegh, and right. then installed that brutal d dictator, the Shah of Iran. They helped him train his secret police forces that tortured and brutalized people until they finally revolted in 79. And, and of course, the U.S. doesn't say, well, you know, we're responsible for what we did here. They simply say, oh, they hate us for our freedom and values. They've taken the diplomats hostage. This is terrible. Well, the anger and the hatred was rooted again in empire and interventionism once again. And time and time again, throughout the world, Guatemala, Chile, you go and you look at the problems and you say, oh, I see foreign interventionism, regime change operations. Yes. That's why people need to question this apparatus, Joe. It's not just saying leave the apparatus there. We're saying question the existence of the national security state right. apparatus. Right. Uh, hold on. W we're getting a little static from you. Do you know why, why that's yeah, the case? Yeah. The, the microphone on the side. I mean, okay. I uh, you, we're getting a little bit of static as you're speaking, and I'm not sure if the microphone got <coughs> misplaced or something like that. I just want to let you know. I mean, we can hear you okay. clearly, but uh, it, it, we, we have some static as, as you are speaking. I'm not sure if you can hear that from me or if it's our line or whatever, but I just want to let you know. I couldn't tell, but it may be coming from it hitting my shirt or something. Okay, now that's that's much better right there. Okay, okay. perfect. <laughs> you, you fixed yourself. <laughs> Thank you. I wish I could do it that easily. <laughs> Life should be that easy, huh? <laughs> exactly. Well, right. well, I don't see where we're going. It, it doesn't seem that we... Uh, a few people are waking up or really starting to think logically. What I feel uh, uh, um, gratified about is that there are uh, organizations such as Young Americans for Liberty, Students for Liberty, and young people seem to be gravitating toward, away from, not toward, but away from the staunch conservatives, the staunch uh, progressives, and I'm starting to say, well, what, maybe these people aren't 100% right. 
at least they're considering the the classical liberal, the libertarian, you know, free mind thinking, and they seem. But once it seems, Jacob, once they they have that aha moment, they become rabbit. I mean, they just they they get excited and they they want to tell the world this. But we wish the numbers were just larger. Uh, do you have any idea of 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 how we're progressing in this regard? Well, I don't know numbers. It's it's uh, it's like any movement. You really don't know how many people are involved. But I get the sense that this is an enormous movement. I mean, you 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 caught a glimpse of it in, in a sense in Ron Paul's campaign, where all of a sudden hundreds of thousands of people came out of the woodwork. It shocked me, yeah. uh, calling themselves libertarians. Right. And I think th- this is the result of of the the promotion of ideas on liberty for decades. And, and that's what we do. I mean, we're kind of like we work under the radar screen. And so all these people that are discovering libertarianism and studying Austrian economics and self-educating and, and seeing the, the libertarian websites and the libertarian books, it's really fascinating. And my hunch is that the next time this movement surfaces, it comes back on the radar screen, it's going to be even bigger than it was the last time. Yeah. And you never know how that's going to manifest itself. But look, I mean, two two states legalizing marijuana, that's an incredible achievement. Right. 25 years ago, when I started the Future of Freedom Foundation, that was not even on the table, the right. idea of drug legalization. So ideas do matter. Shows like this matter. That, that you, you think, oh, well, it's just a few people. But when you multiply that out by hundreds of thousands of people all sharing libertarian perspectives with their friends and with others, all of a sudden you see that this is an enormous movement and it's a very exciting movement. Yeah. You know, people don't realize that when you restrain people, especially when you're a child, tell a child, don't do this. <laughs> You know what's on their mind? I'm going to do this, you know. There's this rebellion. See, my wife is smart. She says, hey, have as many girlfriends as you want. Just don't be home late for dinner, you know. I have no girlfriends. <laughs> what can I tell you? She's smart. Now, if she said, don't you dare, I go, well, maybe I should try that, you know. But I haven't, you know. Um, well, it seems that we were strained. Every time we, we, we place people in a box and said, you can't do this, there, there must be some, hum- some human characteristic that says, oh, yeah, I can prove to you that I can can do this and and we make it more appetizing to do the wrong thing why don't we make it more appetizing to do the right thing and we it seems like the entire nation my wife says this all the time she says you know she says this entire nation is inside out there's black is white and white is black in about every single policy that we we foster uh and it, she finds it so incredibly frustrating, and she's not politically oriented at all, but she knows it. I mean, she, she's in business, and she's an audiologist, and, and she sees this from people all the time. And did she, her frustration, she says, how do we get out of this? You know, what do we do? Do we have to leave the country in order to be truly a free person? And I don't have the answer for her. And I'm, she said, well, ask Jake, Jacob. So I'm, now I'm going to ask you, so help me with that. Well, it sounds like your wife is a very wise woman, with one possible exception, you know. Uh, she chose you, Joe. I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wish I could disagree with you, but I tell her that all the time. I go, what'd you pick me for? You know? <laughs> Were you having too much to drink at the time or what? <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, Joe, just kidding. Uh, you, you know, the, the thing about, you know, the big drug war and all the people on drugs, I often ask myself, what is it that motivates so many people to take mind-altering substances? That's really the root of, of the issue here. Uh, and my hunch is that a large portion of it is that people honestly believe they live in a free society. And they look around and they say, if this is freedom, I mean, like, forget it. I mean, you saw this in the Soviet Union where a lot of people had uh, alcoholic problems. Oh, yeah, and very because, alcohol problem, right. Yeah, that's because when you live in a socialist system, it's very constrained, it's very tightened, it's very controlled, and it's like you can't break out. It's like you were suggesting earlier, you want to break out, you want to be free. Well, the American people uh, suffer from a different malady, and it's, it's inscribed in, in the words of Johann Goethe, who said, none are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. Right. So Americans think they're free, but they are just as constrained as people in the Soviet Union, at least in principle, maybe not in degree, but in principle they are. 
And so they say, well, man, this is, I'm tripping out. You know, when you, when you live a false reality, you, you tend to start looking for ways to, uh, to alleviate your, your condition. And I think that's one of the major reasons people are tripping out on drugs. And I think your concept of the forbidden fruit concept is very important, especially with young people. You make drug, drugs illegal and it's like, hey, there's an allure there for young people. Well, let me go try this out. And so what we have to do, Joe, here's the fundamental question that needs to be debated all across America. What is the role of government in a free society? Should it be controlling, regulating, and making illegal peaceful activity? I mean, we all agree that things like murder, rape, and other violent acts should be made illegal. But should the role of government be to make peaceful activity illegal? And should the role of government be to have a huge military and a CIA that's out policing the world? That's a critical question yeah. here. And, you know, it's a shame when you look at statistics. We have the largest prison uh, incarceration rate, the largest, uh, highest number of prisoners per percent of population. Uh, we have now private prisons that profit by uh, having fill, full cells. So there's an encouragement there to, to arrest as many people as possible. Get them in here so we can make some money. And uh, we seem to be doing everything which is the antithesis of freedom. Uh, we are incarcerating people for maybe having a uh, uh, one stick of marijuana on them and they serve time in jail. They ruin their lives. They come out. They can't get a job because they have a prison record. It, it perpetuates this society of, uh, of misfits that, that cannot really thrive in a, in a society that is so controlled as we are now. And we, all we do is exasperate this by adding more rules and regulations. And, and the perception is that we need all the rules and regulations. Listen to all these the neocons that are running for, for office. They're all in for more rules and regulations and stricter, stricter. They use the word, we need a stricter enforcement of all these rules and regulations. You know, we're not going to be, we're not going to be mamby pambies. We're going to make certain that, you know, when people break the law that they suffer the consequences. Well, heck, we got uh, the largest prison um, population in the world and, and yet we, we need even more. Well, uh, it, it would seem like, why don't we make the United States just a prison? And then it, it's almost being that way because we are, in fact, in prison, although we don't have bars, but we are restricted from doing so much that that should be our natural right to do. Well, that's right. I mean, we're serfs, really, we're serfs. Uh, but your point about mass incarceration is fantastic. I mean, yeah, it's a big business. There's a lot of people that thrive off, say, the drug war. You got federal judges. I mean, if there wasn't a drug war or a war on immigrants, they'd be sitting there in their chambers twiddling their thumbs. Right. A large part of their docket is, is drug cases and so forth. And uh, mass incarceration, I mean, it's big business. And you alluded to the military-industrial complex, the weapons providers, the, the, the defense contractors, all this. This is a huge racket both on the warfare state side and the welfare state side. And I think once people start realizing this is a racket that is designed to plunder and loot them through the taxes that you were talking about earlier, then all of a sudden we got a chance for change because there's no reason why we shouldn't even have an income tax. If you got government down to its legitimate functions and got rid of all the illegitimate functions, you wouldn't need an income tax. That is correct. Uh, and so that's why I keep saying is that people need to raise their vision to a higher level. And this is no different from what the founding fathers did. And when they raised their vision to a higher level, they didn't run state churches. They said, we're going to raise it to a point where government's got no business in religion. And so that's why we need to do the same on economy. Government's got no business in the economy any more than it does in religion. It's got no business in education. It's got no business policing the world. And all of a sudden, now you're talking about a truly limited government and a free people. Yep. And, of course, when people, uh, when the candidates talk about uh, our uh, 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 our debt, our national debt, especially our unfunded debt, um, they don't really want to talk specifics. They just say that, you know, we need to... Uh, we need to do something about it, which means nothing because they have to really dismantle the uh, welfare state, warfare state, in order to balance the budget. And that's never going to happen. And there's only one solution to it, and that's a collapse of our currency. In order to pay off of all of these trillions of dollars in debt, we need to have enough um, uh, 
monopoly money to do this because we can't do it with hard money. That can never happen. The feds will never raise rates. And let me go on record. They will never raise rates. If they raise rates, rates, all they're going to do is exasperate the, uh, the, the deficit even further. And we're going to lose our position as a world's reserve currency because no one will want to buy our bonds because they'll know that our debt is unsustainable and the ball game will be over. And I'll go on record saying we will never raise rates. And yet, so we have a, a zero interest rate environment. And yet, we still can't get the economy going and we're still piling up debt like crazy albeit only f- this year estimated at 456 billion dollars we're way down from last year but still the uh, unfunded debt keeps on piling up and if 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 we look at the numbers that professor Kutlikoff from the university of uh, boston uh, uh, publishes we're well over one uh, quarter uh, i mean 250 trillion dollars in unfunded debt um that's more than the current debt of the entire world. And, and yet, no one wants to address it. It's like, you know, it's like the crazy uncle, you know, in the closet. You know, you, no one talks about him. And I, I, I don't see this to be very sustainable. And sometimes I think that possibly the only way we, the people will eventually wake up is when the system fails and they have to do some really hard soul searching. And they say, you know, I believed all this and it didn't work. Why didn't it work? And maybe some of the words that you've been espousing will be will resonate with them. And they'll say, maybe there's something to this libertarian philosophy. Maybe we don't need the big government that we thought we needed. You think that's possible? Yeah, but it concerns me because in, in whenever you have a big crisis like that, like you had in the Great Depression, which was caused by the Federal Reserve, right. contrary to what they teach students, that the failure of free enterprise, it's all false and nonsensical, um, that you get a crisis and people then, the government's going to use that as an opportunity to seize even more powers. Yeah. And that's what Roosevelt did. And so that's what does concern me about a crisis. It can go in the wrong direction. Um, so I'd like to think that maybe we can turn things around before then, and I'm glad you brought this up. I mean, we can see Greece, the country Greece. I mean, we, we see it's gone into bankruptcy. Why? Out of control spending, out of control debt, um, and, and it's still in bankruptcy. Uh, so why do, why do people think that cannot happen to the United States? Where the government is spending far more than what's bringing it in in taxes, they have this illusion that oh well, if they can just work, grow their way out, you know, which means more taxpayers paying more money to finance their war machine and their welfare state machine, it's not happening anymore, right. as you point out. So they're they're trapped. They 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 can't raise interest rates because that'll put more businesses out of business, which means less taxes. They won't cut government spending. They're spending more than they ever have. Every time the debt ceiling comes up, which is an acknowledgement that too much debt is a bad thing, they raise it. And so, yeah, things are going in a very bad direction. This cannot end nicely unless we libertarians prevail and people see that, hey, we can change the system before the big crisis comes. And that's what this is all about. Now, last question, because we, we are about almost out of time. Um, who do you see as a libertarian candidate for president in the next election? Uh, oh, gosh, I, I don't know. I don't keep up too much with, with politics. I, I hear that Gary Johnson's going to run again for the yep. Libertarian Party, okay. but I don't know if that's the case. I haven't kept up with it too much. But Gary's a fantastic candidate. I mean, he was governor of New Mexico. Right. Uh, he's a great exponent for libertarianism. He's fought the drug war for a long time, and he would bring a really good libertarian perspective to the uh, – to the presidential race, so um, let's hope uh, let's hope he throws his hat in the ring again. Yep. Yeah, well, we have a good viable candidate. This I will dedicate this broadcast to that to that uh, uh, that candidate, and I will do everything that I can. Um, you know, I've been doing this for about 14 years now. It's been a labor of love. And um, I, I just wish I had a yardstick in saying, well, this is what I've actually produced in the past 14 years. I don't have that. That is frustrating, although I receive uh, every once in a while you, you receive feedback that is quite gratifying, and that sort of keeps me going. Well, Jacob, I want to thank you so much for being our guest. Once again, you've been a terrific, uh, enlightening guest. Uh, I'd like to give you the next uh, 30 seconds or a minute if you want to tell our audience um, how they can reach you, something about your organization. 
Yeah, well, Joe, thank you. I mean, I, I, I think it's so gratifying to be on a show like this where the, the host truly has a clear vision of the problems of America and what we need to do. And so it's an honor to be on a show like this. I, I think it's fantastic that you're spreading this word. And if people want to check out our work at the Future of Freedom Foundation, it's at FFF.org. We have a free daily email that we send out that really is the best, I think, the libertarian editorial page on the Internet. And we've got some great books and other resources, so FFF.org. All right. Jacob, so much. I hope you will accept our invitation to return at a later date. I'd love to. Thank okay. You, Thank you it's so been much. a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Right. Bye-bye now. Folks, this is the end of today's program. We'd like to thank our sponsors for the financial support, and we'd like to thank you for listening in. You can further the cause of liberty by recommending this program to your friends, but let us hear from you. Our email address is comments at libertytalkradio.com. Remember, as my wife would say, you are either allowing your liberties to be taken away or you're striving to protect them. You know, it takes a little bit more effort to strive than to let. Understand that. That's what she's saying. Until next time, this is Joe Cristiano. You've been listening to Liberty Talk Radio. Until next time, stay well. Stay tuned. <laughs>